Hi, welcome to Rules of Acquisition number eight. This replaces an older one. Uh, this is the new rule of acquisition number eight. This one is titled Science is Anarchy. And you can see I kind of lifted the logo from the popular TV series Sons of Anarchy. And I have a guy holding a globe with an atom in it. And I figured a modern rifle is a good representation of scientific advancement, like it or leave it. Uh, like it or not, that is a interesting technological development in and of itself, forgetting its uh, dark side. And that's a good point. Science has dark sides to all the applications of everything. So it's a very appropriate. So anarchy is one of the most abused words in the English language. The actual word means no ruler. The word is also used to describe the chaos which supposedly results from the lack of rule. Like, for example, people say, oh, there's going to be chaos in this, or there's going to be anarchy in the streets, which is basically what they're saying, there's going to be anarchy in the streets. As a comparison, we just say, compare this to the word monarchy, which means one ruler, or oligarchy, which means ruled by a small group. Okay, but we're going to use this meaning that there's no ruling body in science. Science is anarchy. Now, that might seem surprising to you, I mean, there are engineers who have standards groups and stuff like that, but that's not science, that's engineering. Okay, in science, everyone is free to believe what they want. Now, within a little limitation, because there are little serfdoms where noncompliance can get you censored. Like, for example, if you work for a journal and you believe that the earth is flat, they're probably going to fire you. Or if you're part of a research organization and you don't, you know, you're not a good fit with what everybody believes are probably going to give you your walking papers. And university departments, unless you have tenure, um, they're going to basically tell you to take a hike if you're going to do something that's going to cause them any problem with accreditation. Okay, but this lack of rule in science, this lack of, of, of enforcement of rules has both good, ugly, and bad consequences. One of the uglies is a morphing of the truth. And, and let me give you the example using a telephone game analogy. In a telephone game, what you do is you whisper somebody something to the first person in the line. They whisper it to the next person, whisper, 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 whisper. And then what you do is you have the first and the last person compare what was whispered to them. And it's a big gag how different and how the information is morphed. And this is what happens in science. Because each generation of scientists become the author and the teacher for the next generation, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And over time, things morph. Truths that are supposedly irrefutable truths morph. And sometimes, by accident, they morph in the right direction. But some people don't realize it. Let me give you an example with field energy. On Maxwell's Treaties of Electricity and Magnetism, the 1890s, uh, publication, he clearly indicates in multiple places that magnetic fields store kinetic energy and electric fields store potential energy. Today, however, electromagnetic theory treats field energy as a ubiquitous thing. No delineation between potential or kinetic. And that's gonna, that causes me problems, which we'll correct later. Ether, one of my favorite ones. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, scientists developed the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction to reconcile the null result of the Michelson Morley experiment with the ether. But over the years, that has gotten morphed into they disproved the ether. Because if you ask most scientists and engineers today, they're going to tell you that the ether was disproved by the null result of the Michelson Morley experiment. Well, if they tell you that, this is what you ask them. You ask them, well, since velocity is a relative measurement, okay, what is the V in this equation measured relative to? And watch them squirm. Watch them come up with, oh, blah, 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 you got to understand this, and blah, 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 you don't understand, blah, 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 it's, a, it's the preferred reference frame, blah, 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 blah. It's going to be gibberish. It's going to come out of their, their baloney hole. Okay, the V in this equation is measured relative to the medium, which is the ether. Tell them to go look it up. Number three, Maxwell's EM waves versus what we use today. In Maxwell's 
derivation, the electric and magnetic fields are in phase as a light wave propagates. But that's not what we use today. We use e to the j omega for all of our light wave propagation stuff. And there are the potential and kinetic energy components, if you want to call them, that are 90 degrees out of phase. The problem with the Maxwell is, is where these fields go to zero, the energy goes to zero. Where these fields are at their maximum, that's where the energy goes. So you got a, pro a photon, as it propagates from left to right, goes from no energy to energy to no energy. So you've got a blinking photons. This is ridiculous. Where does the energy go when the photon passes this point? With the e to the j omega that everybody uses, the photon has constant energy as it propagates or travels, depending on how you word it. And this is like one of the greatest bait and switch. I mean, in this book here, which I had for my master's class, they go in and two and they say, Maxwell, 18 secret formula, the theory of electromagnetic propagation that predicted existence of radio waves. All hail Maxwell. All hail Maxwell. But the remainder of the book, they're using e to the j omega, which has nothing to do with Maxwell's equations. So it's like, this crap just, ah, so sick of this crap that people don't understand their field enough to know the little details and to see that there's problems with the little details. Okay, but luckily it morphed in the right direction in spite of the fact it's not based on Maxwell's equation. So this is ironic that we're able to get success because things change without anybody. Now the reason why I changed this way is because this e to the j omega, which is Euler's equation, is the kernel of the Fourier transform, the compact Fourier transform. And the compact Fourier transform is what engineers use to analyze all sorts of waves. Water waves, sound waves, string waves, waves on the drum, waves in the earth, uh, earthquake waves. And, but all those waves are waves that travel in a medium. If it works for light, which it does, we know that it does, it works very well, therefore light must have a medium. And those people that think that there is no ether are full of baloney. So it's ironic that because this worked for everything else, we applied it somewhere along the way, somebody applied it to light waves and it worked, and so we thought, well, it must be derived from this, and no one ever bothered to go back to check. Your guess is as good as mine, folks. But there's also... Um, other, some bad elements be having no uh, regulating body is that you end up with all these different competing things. Like, for example, in a property, if you go to Wiki and look at properties of water, look at all the different names. Water is called oxidane, hydrogen oxide, dihydrogen monoxide, hydrogen hydroxide, hydric acid, hydroxic acid, hydrol. Okay, and there's some others there. I just didn't feel like writing them all down. In other parts of science, different words mean the same thing. In other parts of science, the same word means different things. And electrical engineers still use positive current flow, which is left over from the days of Maxwell, where physicists use negative current flow. That means when computing the magnetic field direction, electrical engineers use the right-hand rule, and physicists use the left-hand rule, and that's why there's a lot of problem handshaking between the two of us. There's also some, this is a minor nit, is that things get twisted around in popular culture. In physics, the word quantum means the tiniest little bit you can measure. That's what quanta or quantum means. Quanta is multiple, but quantum is the smallest thing you can measure. And yet we have a show quantum leap, which ostensibly means a large leap. And the Royal Canadian Cruise Line, I believe that's them, have decided to name their biggest, biggest ship the quantum of the seas. Good grief. And there's also propagation of errors as well. Or there's propagation of errors that, that don't get morphed toward the correct. For example, we all went to school and they told us that there's five senses. You got sight, sound, touch, smell, taste. But wait a minute. In your inner ear, there's things these called semicircular canals. These are like little gyroscopes that give you your sense of balance. So there's another organ for a sense of balance. And also, what if I do this? All right, now compare that to this. Which set of finger snaps 
Was there a longer delay between? You're going to say the second set. That means you have the ability to sense the passage of time. So there's another sense, which is the sense of time. So the movie The Sixth Sense should have been named This Eighth Sense. But, you know, you could probably go nuts coming up with different senses. It's all senseless. But in other words, there's no ruling body to go to and say, Aha! We're all now going to believe there's eight, six, or seven senses. There's no ruling body. And there's also false perceptions. Some people think that being published in a peer-reviewed journal means that their scientific work is accepted as all, by all as irrefutable. Wrong! The journal does not do, actually do the peer review. They just do a basic check of the facts. Like, for example, this um, cold fusion thing was published in a peer-reviewed journal. Peer, the journal doesn't have the resources to reconduct the experiment. They don't. They just publish. As long as it looks reasonable, they publish it. It's all the people that read the journal do the peer review. In most cases, what people publish is something nobody ever cares about, so they never bother to check. So I bet you a good portion of the stuff published in journals is gibberish. This was important because this, this was a fantastic breakthrough. So everyone wanted to take a look at it. And a lot of people tried to recreate the experiment and couldn't get the same results. And so this has become somewhat of a debacle. Okay, and... How, this is in the previous issue of Popular Science. How common is scientific fraud? The short answer, at least one in 50 scientists is doing something fishy. My friends, I'm going to tell you right now, it's probably a lot more than that. Because a lot of scientists work for grant money and research money and they can't have a case where their research goes bad because then they won't get the next set of grant and research money. So there's a lot of impetus to fudge data to get a positive outcome. Luckily for me, I do this on my own. If I fail at this, I fail at this. It doesn't affect my job or anything like that. So I don't have uh, any incentive to pull any punches here. My thing doing ethereal mechanics and all this stuff is to improve science. So, you know, I, I don't work for grant money, so I'm under no pressure. There's also other false perceptions out there because a lot of over unity free energy enthusiasts often claim that over unity free energy efforts are being suppressed because science is controlled by big money interests really to whom is big money bribing I mean there's no ruling body in science who are they bribing the only entity which decides whether an invention works or not is mother nature and she can't be bribed so the silver lining is there's no limits except those imposed by mother nature and human ignorance, which is also nature. So the good of this whole thing is there's no ruling body which will persecute you for pursuing theories and or research which differs from what is popularly believed. The unfortunate is that there's no ruling body which will make your new theory the law of the land overnight. In other words, you just can't go and say, you know, my new theory is that there's eight senses and then all these people say, aha, that's true, we're going to write that into the books, that's what everybody's supposed to believe right now. And anybody who doesn't believe it is going to get thrown in jail. There's no such thing like that. So the silver lining is big money can't stop you unless, of course, you know, they outright have put a hit out on you and whatever, whatever. And the ugly, although there's no ruling body to help or hurt, those that control grant research funds may decide that the limited funds are better spent elsewhere that's okay. It's always been the case. There's always alternatives. Wright Brothers funded themselves. They couldn't get funding. They got their own funding. Side note. Tenure was supposed to encourage out-of-the-box thinking among professors by protecting their jobs against the potential backlash of proposing unpopular ideas. To push the envelope, as it were. Instead, it has become a means to protect incompetence. So, that's just my opinion. I'm sure there's a lot of tenured professors who get real angry at that statement. But, I think if you were an honest, good professor, you would realize that a lot of people hold on to the jobs that were, were maybe too old to be doing this job anymore, and that a younger professor would probably be a better asset. So, you know, that's just my opinion. So what is required of us? Salesmanship. A theory or model in and of itself has no value to anyone. Saying that you know the truth is point. There's so many people that get on my comments and say, ah, you know, this is a uh, hyper flyroid, daga daga baboo boo, and speak all kinds of gibberish. I'm like, yeah, so? 
So do something with it. If you're so sure that it's important that something is a double helix, wadi wadi wa why are you telling me? Why don't you do something with it? You can call it, you can call it purple with pink polka dots. It doesn't make anything more valuable out of it. So a new theory will succeed if its benefits can be demonstrated such that the average person can understand and appreciate it. Okay, that's all that matters. And that's part of rule of acquisition, the new rule of acquisition, that usefulness is the only value of a theory. Not whether it's right or wrong, only if it's useful. Does it solve an important problem? Does it provide a new form of energy or cure a disease? That's all that matters. Even wrong models can give good, give good answers. So when people say something is an accepted scientific theory, there's no ruling body that's accepted it. What they're saying, in fact, is that the majority of scientists generally agree with it, whatever that theory is. But again, the rule of acquisition number seven, which is already out there, popularity does not prove something is right. Just because everybody believes something does not mean it's true. And just because there's no ruling body to appeal theory changes to, changing accepted theory requires each, either of the following approaches, either salesmanship and patience to get slowly get the body of science to accept it, or a Wright Brothers moment. This is my terminology. What's a Wright Brothers moment? Well, a public demonstration of a working device for which the average person understands the importance of. It's like a public, for example, the Wright Brothers, this is what it's named after, did a public demonstration of their flying machine and overnight changed the accepted scientific theory, virtually. Because before them, the physicists were saying, Lord Kelvin said publicly, that heavier than air flight is an impossibility. So just because, again, somebody has an advanced degree attached to their name does not mean they know anything. All they know is what they know. So Benjamin Franklin, the doorstep to the temple of wisdom is a knowledge of our own ignorance. We have to know our limitations if we're going to be able to supersede those limitations. And that's what I put there because it was right next to it and I thought it was funny. Thank you. <laughs>